bow our heads in preparation for the teaching of God's Word. Father, we thank you, Lord, for sending your Son, the Lord mm -hmm. Jesus Christ, to be our substitute, to be our Savior. We thank you for salvation, full and free. We thank you, Father, that now as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we can follow you, Father. We can dedicate our life to you to serve you, Father. And we look forward to the return of Christ for the church and then eventually, Father, the second coming to establish your kingdom. Help us to understand more clearly and accurately your prophetic program and may it encourage us to keep looking forward with hope. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, uh, we're continuing uh, on the kingdom. I have several, several requests to continue uh, dealing with the subject of the kingdom. So we're going to talk about the government of the kingdom this afternoon. And Arnold Frutenbaum is very helpful in establishing the chart here uh, of the government of the king. Of course, Jesus, Messiah, is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He will rule and reign from the city of Jerusalem during the 1,000-year kingdom. He will defeat his enemies at the second coming and establish that kingdom. And the Lord will set his king upon the holy hill of Zion, as we will see in Psalm chapter 2. There are two branches of the future theocratic kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is the Jewish branch, which did with resurrected David uh, as co-regent, reigning over the nation of Israel. And then under David will be the 12 apostles. Under the 12 apostles, there will be various princes, <coughs> judges and counselors, and then citizens of, of the nation of Israel, Jews and Gentiles under them. Under the Gentile branch, there'll be the church age believer. And we will have the opportunity, we have the opportunity today to continue in the Word of God. And if we're faithful, God will appoint many of us as rulers in that kingdom. So that's part of our reward is being faithful so that we will reign and have positions of authority with Christ. Now all believers will be in the kingdom. I believe all believers will be in, in the kingdom. But some believers will have greater positions of authority ruling over nations and cities in that coming kingdom. And we'll look at a few verses here on that later. We're going to look at these individual verses here. But I just want to outline this for you. Underneath that, there'll be various kings of the earth bringing homage to the Lord Jesus Christ. There will be nations in the kingdom. Uh, Christ will rule over all the nations, but there'll be individual nations within that theocratic reign. And then there'll be Gentile nations underneath various kings and leaders. So this is the outline here of the government of the future uh, kingdom. And we will begin with Christ's reign in the book of Psalms. So let's take a look at Psalm chapter two. Psalm chapter two. And we'll begin with verse one. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. So here the na nations are in an uproar. The nations are in rebellion against the coronation of the Lord's, Lord's uh, Messiah. Uh, the word rage is an interesting word in, in the uh, Hebrew. And that word rage can be mean restless, and the idea of, of nations in an uproar or in a rage is also a picture of their rebellion against the Messiah. I want to take a look just briefly at the dictionary of biblical languages, this word uh, rage. The word rage means being in rebellion. It means to be restless to conspire or to be an open defiance of a king at coronation, and therefore implying tumult and disorderly conduct in the act of attempting the overthrow of government. So the various uh, kings will try to overthrow 
the rule of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think this occurs at the second coming of Christ. Uh, Revelation chapter 19 depicts Christ coming to judge his enemies and they're going to try to rebel against him as he returns and tries to inaugurate his kingdom. So let's go back here to Psalm chapter 2. And the people are plotting a useless thing. How, they go, uh, how are the weak leaders of these various nations going to throw over the Son of God? Throw aside his kingdom. They can. It's a futile endeavor. They take plans and plot together against the Lord and against his anointed. Notice the distinction between the Lord, God the Father, and his anointed, Christos, the Son. We get the word Messiah from this uh, Greek word, from this Hebrew expression, his anointed. I think in the Septuagint, uh, we have the title for Christ or the Messiah. So the leaders take counsel against the Lord and his Christ or Christos. This is a direct reference to the Lord Jesus Christ saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast their cords from us. They don't want to be bound to the rulership of the Lord and the Lord Jesus Christ. And God's going to sit and laugh at all this a futile attempt. Uh, he who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold him in confusion or derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath. And the wrath of God will be poured out upon these evil leaders trying to stop uh, or prevent Messiah from being inaugurated. He will distress them in his deep displeasure. But notice verse 6, Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. And so this is the king of kings and lord of lords whom God appoints to rule in Jerusalem over the various nations in his kingdom. God's going to set up his king and no amount of rebellion and tumult and rage will prevent that from occurring. He says, I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, if this is part of God's divine plan, you are my son. Notice Jesus Christ is the son of God. And so we have that expression in the Old Testament uh, where we get the New Testament phrase, son of God. Jesus Christ has set his son as ruler over these various nations. Now the word today I've begotten you doesn't refer to the birth of Christ. Uh, we know the word begotten or only begotten means unique, one of a kind. The idea is today I have declared your sonship. And so Reynolds Showers has written an excellent little book on this. Uh, there are those who deny the eternal sonship of Christ, saying the Son had a beginning, but he's referring here to his deity, and he's acknowledging his deity. He has declared his sonship, and his Son, as a Son, he has the right to rule over creation. So the Son of God, he declares his sonship, and having his right to rule over the various nations of the earth. And being a son, he has an inheritance. And this leads us into verse 8. And what is the son's inheritance? Well, the ends of the earth. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. And the ends of the earth for your possession. So all the nations of the earth. This is a worldwide rulership. This is the future kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. He will rule over all the nations. It belongs to him. As a matter of fact, when we see in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 4 and 5, as he opens the various sealed trumpet and bold judgments, we have a scroll that pictures the title deed to planet Earth. So he has the right to rule over his creation. Adam lost this right to rule. Adam was given dominion over God's creation. Therefore, the Son of Man will take back what Adam lost from Satan and rule over the various nations of the world. And he's gonna rule with absolute authority. We speak of someone ruling with an iron fist or the idea of a rod of iron here is used, the imagery of absolute authority. Uh, the nations of the earth, he will rule with great authority. 
So let's take a look at verses 8 and 9 again. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. Obviously this, this inheritance doesn't refer to heaven. He's not talking about some spiritual reign in people's hearts either. This is a literal, physical, <clears throat> earthly reign over the nations of the earth. You're going to break them in pieces with a rod of iron. You're going to dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. You're going to, and this occurs at the second coming as Christ speaks with the, and the sword comes out of his mouth and destroys his enemies. And then he's going to rule with utter absolute authority over those various nations. Now, therefore, here's some advice for the kings. Therefore, be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Notice, we have kings and judges who will try to rebel against the Lord, but he said, serve the Lord. The word serve means give homage to the Lord with respect, fear. Rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, give homage to the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Sounds like John 3.16, doesn't it? Uh, but you shall not perish, but have eternal life. Being, place your faith and confidence in the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. So clearly we have a righteous reign of the Lord Jesus Christ over the various nations of the world. They're, they are his inheritance. Now, we're going to, go, we're going to look at this passage here, um, fast forward, and look at the comparison here between Revelation chapter 11, verse 18, and Psalm chapter 2. Revelation eleven eighteen 18 speaks of the rage of the nations and their rebellion. Notice the nations were angry and your wrath has come. And this has occurred during the tribulation period. But at the end, God's going to resurrect the dead, the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints. Now, this is not church-age believers. These are individuals uh, who lived during the tribulation. And those who fear your name, small and great, and you should destroy those who do what? Destroy the earth. Destroy the earth. Through what? Sin pollution. <laughs> Talk about the environment. You're destroying the earth through sin pollution. You're wrecking, wrecking havoc upon God's creation. Now, the timing of this is the raging. Uh, it occurs right at the establishment of the kingdom. Notice the parallel between Psalm 2.6 and Revelation 11.15. Yet I've set my king on my holy hill of Zion. Revelation 11.15 says, Then the seven angels sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of the world has become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. So Christ will establish his earthly kingdom, and this will occur at the second coming of Christ. Now, the, at this point, the seventh angel, the seventh uh, trumpet judgment, has sounded. Why is the announcement that the kingdom's of the world that become the kingdoms of the Lord and of his Christ. There's still a series of judgment called the bold judgments that haven't been poured out. Why does he, why does he announce this at this point? Well, if you understand what is called the telescopic view of the book of Revelation, you understand that the opening of the seventh trumpet also includes seven bowls, which leads up to the point of the second coming. So, if you think about it, I used to have what, a, a, three, a telescope in three parts, a little, you know, those little uh, spy glasses that open up into three sections. So you have the seal judgments in, uh, that are compact, you compact it down to one, one uh, eyeglass, and then you start to open up each section. The seal judgments include this, the trumpet and bowl judgments, okay? And the trumpet judgments include the bowl judgments. That's why it's called the telescopic view of revelation. So when the seventh trumpet judgment is open, that includes all the bowl judgments, which anticipates finally the second coming. That's why we have this announcement. 
It's anticipation of after God pouring out these judgments and judging his enemies, he will establish his eternal kingdom. So we have certainly a definite order here. The kingdom is announced as established only after these judgments have run their course, which are meaning at the end of the tribulation. So we have the timing of this coming kingdom, meaning that we are not in the kingdom now. The church is not the kingdom. The kingdom will be established, and this announcement occurs at the end of the judgments of the tribulation. All right. So the kingdom, coming kingdom, uh, will occur when his anointed one, Christ, will reign over all the nations of the earth. The timing of that kingdom in Revelation chapter 12, verse 5. Let's take a look at Revelation chapter 12. Here we have a broad sweep of history. And this section right here, we have a picture of the angelic conflict, the ongoing angelic conflict. Going back to, a, uh, to Satan's original rebellion uh, in heaven and drawing a third of the stars of heaven, meaning one third of the angels that fell with Satan. And so this angelic conflict would continue between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. And this is played out in the book of Revelation. So he's drawing here a broad sweep of history in the past and history in prophecy future. So Satan originally drew a third star, third of the stars of heaven in his initial rebellion against God. Then we have the dragon standing before the woman, which the dragon is pictured as Satan standing before the woman who's ready to give birth. And this is the first coming of Christ. Satan tried to destroy and prevent the Messiah from being born. By the way, there was attack on the line of Christ in the Old Testament. Many attempts to destroy the coming Messiah, prevent the Messiah from coming, including the sons of God attack in Genesis chapter six. It's a really interesting study of the prevention, trying to prevent the coming of Christ. But we even have Herod trying to destroy, you know, all those two and under. And that was part of the dragon's attempt to prevent the birth of the Messiah. Because Messiah would eventually crush the serpent's head. So here the dragon is picturing his first coming, Satan, is trying to devour the child as soon as it is born. Now, verse 5 indicates, though, the woman did bring forth the male child. Now, who's the woman? The woman's not Mary here, as Catholics try to teach. The woman is not Mary. The woman is Israel. Israel, the nation Israel, gave birth to the Messiah. And notice here, in the first coming, that we have the birth of the Messiah, and he's qualified now to rule over all nations, and this is his coming kingdom. So she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Now that imagery of rod of iron is taken out of Psalm 2. And so it's absolute authority, and that, by the way, that phrase rod of iron is mentioned several times in the Bible. And I think it's three times that expression, rod of iron, is mentioned here, including that passage in the book of Psalms. So I'll just do a quick search here. Four times. Psalm 2 9, Revelation 2 27. Notice here, he will rule them with a rod of iron. Uh, they shall be dashed to pieces like a potter's vessel. This is quoted in Revelation 2 27. Revelation 12 5, and then Revelation 19 15, when he returns in his second coming. He's going to strike the nations and rule them with a rod of iron. He treads the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. So Revelation picks up on this imagery of Christ's future kingdom rule. And that's very important to make that connection back to Psalm 2, Psalm chapter 2. So those three expressions in the book of Revelation, Revelation 2.27, Revelation 12.5, Revelation 19.15, all point to Psalm 2.9. And that messianic rule. 
Now, Revelation 12, 5, that child was caught up to God and his throne. With that, we call that the ascension. Okay? And then, future, in the future, the woman fled into the wilderness. This is the tribulation period in which the nation of Israel is protected by God. Those Jews that flee are protected by God during the second half of the tribulation for 1,260 days. But the point here in the sweeping overview of history about the Messiah, we have the outline here of the first coming of Christ, the birth of the birth of that promised seed, whom the dragon tried to destroy Satan, verse 5. We have the fact that he is an inheritor of the covenant promises, being a Jew, and therefore we refer to his first coming there. Presently, he ascended into the right hand of the Father, verse 5. We call that his present session. And then the future would be what? His rulership over the nations with great authority in his kingdom. Lest you think that that's occurring today, you say, well, that's, you know, well, we have the ascension there pictured after the kingdom. But notice the passage that he will rule, rule over the nations. His first coming qualifies him to rule as son of man because he has humanity, he took on human nature. And that's why he, as son of man, has the right to rule over the nations. He's simply giving an outline here of history. He will rule, rule the nations. When we compare that with Revelation chapter 19, we see that that rulership with the rod of iron occurs at his second coming. So that's the clue when we look at Psalm 2-7. When we look at how it's used in Revelation, we see that that kingdom rule is still future. That kingdom rule is still future. Okay, now let's go back here. We want to look at the government here now and look at the fact that David is resurrected as co-regent. Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 24. Let's begin there. Ezekiel 37, verse 24. David, my servant, will be king over them, over the nation of Israel. Notice, uh, they will be my people, I will be their God, them, referring to the Jews. David will be king over them. And how will he be king? Well, he will be resurrected and he will act as co-regent. He will rule with Christ. So this is a reference to uh, not the Messiah, but there are several passages in which indicates that David personally will rule over the nation of Israel. And I don't think this is the re reference to, some say, well, this is another term for the Messiah. No, this is David. I take it literally, David himself will be resurrected. And they shall all have one shepherd. They shall walk in my judgments and observe my statues and do them. Um, David's going to be their prince too in verse 25. They will dwell in the land that I've given to Jacob, my servant, where your fathers dwell. They shall dwell there, they, their children, their children's children forever. And my servant shall be their prince. David shall be their prince forever. So this is the uh, reign, this is the co-regency of David over the Jewish branch of government. Underneath the authority of David, we have the 12 apostles. Notice Matthew 19, 28. Matthew 19, 28. So Jesus said to them, he's telling his disciples here, assuredly, I say to you that in the regeneration, that's another term for the kingdom, by the way. When the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory. Well, Matthew 24 uh, indicates when that occurs. Matthew 24, Matthew 25, at his second coming, when the Son of Man returns. So he's going to sit on his throne, judging the what? Twelve tribes of Israel. He said, why judging the 12 tribes of Israel? Because the land was given to the Jews, and that's part of that Abrahamic covenant promise. So that's why he's going to divide the land among 12 tribes. Plus, the book of Ezekiel indicates that kingdom division. We'll look at that in a minute. So these disciples will play a role in rulership over those 12 tribes. 
Now, let's take a look here then at a comparison of the land that was inherited by Joshua under Joshua's uh, regime when Joshua, um, Joshua led the children of Israel to the promised land. Notice the tribal divisions. We see Asher and uh, Ephraim, Dan, Gad, and so forth. Now, what we do know, though, is Reuben and Gad, they didn't want to, they, they wanted the land outside the promised land. And so Joshua, you know, said, okay, if you help us when you go into the land, defeat our enemies, then you can have this land on the other side of Jordan. But in the kingdom, right here, what's absent? The possession of land on the other side of Jordan. And Ezekiel chapter 37 uh, verse 13 to 21, we see the boundaries of the promised land and the kingdom. So Ezekiel gives us those various boundaries, and he mentions the various tribes of Israel, a little different as far as where they'll rule, where, what part of the land they will have, but we have Dan in the north, all the way down to Gad in the south. And notice there's gonna be a portion for the priests including the temple of the Lord there around Jerusalem. We have a priest portion there uh, in uh, the land. So without getting into great detail, you can read Ezekiel 47, 13 to 21. So we know though then, therefore the disciples will have a role in ruling over each area or territory where the tribes of Israel rule in the future kingdom. So put those two uh, per verses together and you'll see that God has given the land uh, that he gave to Abraham because he promised that in the Abrahamic covenant. All right, let's go back and look at the government here a little further. Underneath the 12 apostles, there will be various princes ruling over the land of Israel. Isaiah 32.1, Isaiah 32.1. You remember, even Moses had rulers over tribes and out of those tribes there's rulers over thousands and hundreds remember how Moses uh, his father-in-law came to him and said you're taking too much on you uh, you need to divide up and delegate this authority and therefore he divided uh, the various tribes among leaders of you know thousands and hundreds and so forth so there'll be various uh, leaders under the 12 tribes, uh, Isaiah 32, 1. Behold, a king will reign in righteousness. We know who that is, Christ. Notice princes will rule justice. Princes, plural. So there'll be princes also ruling in that kingdom <coughs> that will administer justice when Christ returns. Continuing down the line, there'll be judges and advisors in Isaiah 1, 26. Isaiah chapter 1. Verse 26. I will restore your judges as at the first and your counselors as at the beginning. So there will be judges and counselors in that kingdom. Afterward, you should recall the city of righteousness, the faithful city. And that's referring to Jerusalem. Zion shall be redeemed with justice. So God's going to have judges ruling over and deciding on various cases and advisors uh, among the Jews. Keep in mind, there'll be people in their physical bodies, their natural bodies, so they'll need those who give advice about what God requires, and therefore they will play that, they will have that role in administration. Then the nation of Israel will be head over the Gentiles. The Jews will be the head, not the tail. Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse six, in the coming kingdom. Deuteronomy 15, verse 6. For the Lord your God will bless you just as he promised you. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. You shall reign over many nations, but they shall not reign over you. <laughs> How about that? Who will be prominent in the kingdom among the nations? The Jews in Israel. They will be prominent. They will be the head, not the tail. By the way, this is one truth that progressive dispensationalists deny. 
They said it'll just all be equal in the kingdom. No, no. So the Jews, and they, they focused less on the land. They said, well, we believe in the coming kingdom when Christ rules, but, you know, he, the land's not that important. Well, it is important <laughs> in God's promises. And uh, they kind of look at all the Gentiles as equal. And that's why, by the way, that's how they look at Israel today, too. Just, so, just like equal like all the other nations. But, you know, there's a special cursing and blessing upon those who treat the Jews favorably. They have forgotten that that continues, that blessing cursing in Deuteronomy 12, or excuse me, Genesis 12, verse 3. I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee. And this is something that the progressive dispensationalists try to deny. They try to apply that to Christ and not to the nations today. So, um, he indicates that you're going you're gonna, to uh, lend to many nations, they're not going to borrow, and then you're going to reign over the nations. They're not going to reign over you. We also see another passage which indicates the prominence of the Jews in the kingdom. Zechariah chapter 8, verses 22 and 23. Zechariah 8, verse 22. Yes, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem. So where will Christ reign? In Jerusalem. So this can only occur when Christ is physically present on the earth in Jerusalem. See? And they'll pray before the Lord. So nations will take pilgrimage, pilgrims, uh, a journey to the land of Israel. And they will go there to worship the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, in those days, ten men from every language of the nations shall grasp the sleeve of a Jewish man, saying, they want to tag along with the Jew, because let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Ten Gentiles grabbing hold of the sleeve of a Jew. We know that your God, your God is, is showing your faith, his favor upon you, and we want to go with you. The question is, is that occurring today? <laughs> no, 10 Gentiles want to destroy one Jew. <laughs> it's the opposite. Instead of 10 Gentiles want to go with one Jew because they're blessed. And this will be in the kingdom. It shows you where. It shows you the Jews will have a prominent, special relationship uh, in a place of privilege over the nations, even in the, in the coming kingdom. They'll be the head, not the tail. And then Deuteronomy chapter 28, underneath Israel will be Gentiles. Deuteronomy 28, verse 1. There may be Gentiles living in the land of Israel, um, but uh, they will be underneath the authority of the Jews. Now, should come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth. See that? Once again, privileged position. Prominence above the nations of the earth. And man, it's the opposite today. United Nations, Jews are hated and despised. If we can pass any regulation against the nation of Israel, we'll do it. Um, and certainly, they're the tail, not the head, but not in the kingdom. They're going to be exalted in the coming kingdom because of God's faithfulness to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and his promises. Now, let's take a look at the Gentile branch of government. Uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 26 and 27. Revelation 2, verse 26. This is a promise to church age believers. He's writing here, uh, here to the church at Thyatira, but all seven churches have application to the church age believer in general. So there's application here to the faithful church age believer. We'll start in verse 25. Hold fast while you have your spiritual progress till I come, the return of Christ. He who overcomes, now there's a debate over who are the overcomers? And there are several viewpoints. Uh, Lord of Salvation says, uh, all Christians are guaranteed to be faithful to the end and overcome. 
Therefore, all believers are overcomers. But if you don't overcome, you are never saved in the first place. And that's wrong. The worship salvation, they, uh, if they falsely think that an overcomer, they rightly believe that an overcomer is a victor, but they say that if you're not persevering till the end, then you were never born again. Okay. Uh, uh, let's talk about two views on the free grace side of the coin, which I didn't know until, until a few years ago. I believe that the overcomer is a faithful believer as well. But the overcomer, if you're not an overcomer, it doesn't mean you're not born again. See? Overcoming is related to reward. So I take the overcomer as a faithful Christian who will be rewarded. Now there are others who say, no, well, overcomer refers to all believers because all believers in their position are overcomers. And they try to quote the passage of 1 John and try to apply it to Revelation. But if you look at the context of Revelation, he's talking about good things that the church or churches are doing, bad things that the churches are doing, and then he encourages believers to persevere. So I still believe that an overcomer is a Christian who's faithful. We call it the winner believer. The word Nikeo, by the way, we throw Nike, it means victor. So the winner believer. We could say the winner believer whoever comes and notice keeps my works to the end. So they're faithful. What will God give to the winner believer? Authority over the nations. Think about that. And I take this as a reward. Uh, and that individual will rule them with a rod of iron. He will rule with Christ over the nations. So uh, that winner believer will have authority in the coming kingdom. And then Revelation chapter 3, at the end, by the way, Revelation 3, we have a similar promise in verse 21, Revelation 3, 21, to him who overcomes. Notice he speaks to the individual. He doesn't say the whole church overcomes. He's, I think he's focusing on the individual in the church. To the winner Christian, to the faithful Christian, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. And that means sharing in Christ's rulership over the nations. So having authority in the coming kingdom will be based on the faithfulness of the believer. And notice here, as Christ overcame, now Christ was a victor. Christ was faithful to the end, right? And therefore God rewarded and honored Christ by giving him a highest exalted position at the right hand of the Father. Even as I overcame and sat down with my Father on his throne, notice two separate thrones. Christ is now on the right hand of the Father, sitting on his throne. But that's not the Davidic kingdom. His, his throne is future. And Christ's throne will be on the earth when he returns in the second coming. So this is very important. Two separate thrones. Because progressive dispensationalism teaches that Christ is sitting on David's throne today, and that's false. Christ's, David's throne was never in heaven. And by the way, progressive dispensationalism tries to merge covenant and dispensational theology blend it together, and they don't fit together. And I remember I was at Dallas Seminary in the 90s, and they were trying to promote this idea of Christ sitting on David's throne. You know, and that's never what Chafer taught. Chafer never, Ryrie never taught that. Walbert never taught that. But they were trying to promote this view of Christ sitting on David's throne. But I think this verse refutes that concept. It's a separate throne. The right hand of the Father is not the throne of Christ. My point is, though, that if you're faithful, you'll have a privileged authority uh, in reigning with Christ. Now, another verse, I think, that supports uh, faithfulness and future reign is 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11, 13. This is a faithful saying, for if we die with him, and we did, this is our identity in Christ, every believer died with him, we're guaranteed to live with him. That's, a, that's eternal security. Now in the middle, it refers to our perseverance. If we endure, if we're faithful, we keep plugging away, keep running this race, keep persevering, what will God do as a, as a reward? We will reign with him. Notice we'll reign with Christ in his kingdom. What if we say no as a believer? 
No, thank you. I'm not going to continue in faithfulness. He will deny us. Now, deny us of what? What's the context? Deny us, not of salvation, but deny us of reigning with him. When it comes to reigning with Christ, he'll say, you had no interest in following me as a believer. Then I'm not going to allow you to reign in my administration. Say, for instance, you had a particular politician who was a friend of yours, but you never supported that politician financially. You lived maybe next door to your neighbor. You never went to any of the rallies. You never had any interest whatsoever. And all of a sudden, that politician gets elected to a state position or even the White House. And when he sets up his cabinet, do you think he'll have you in mind? I don't think so. You didn't support him. You didn't encourage him. You didn't show no interest. And therefore, when he sets up his administration, then you're out of the picture. But say you did support him. Say you went out and campaigned for him. Say you contributed financially to him. Say every time you talk to other people, well, you, you need to vote for Joe. You know, this guy over here, when he wins election, you think he'll have you in mind? And some kind of maybe position in the administration? That's how politics works. Now, with the Lord Jesus Christ, that we say, eh, not interested. When he comes to set up his kingdom, do you think he's going to say, well, I'm going to set you up high over this country nation. No, you show no interest to me. Yes, by grace, you're in the kingdom. But no thanks. He's going to say no to you. And that's what I see here. Well, what if we're faithless? What if we're, we don't continue believing or we're not, uh, keep, we're not persevering? He still remains faithful as far as our salvation is concerned. He cannot deny his promises, his own essence. So I think that the idea of uh, uh, verse 12 is best explained and certain believers will not reign with Christ. They will not have place of authority if they don't persevere. It's a rewards concept. So there'll be faithful positions of authority depending on how you serve the Lord. Some will have greater authority. Even Jesus gave a parable, by the way, of the, what was it, Minas. Remember he gave these Minas or talents to individuals. There's two parables. They're almost identical. Uh, and he says, I'm going to give you a certain amount of money and you administer my affairs. You trade with it and grow that account. Some were given five talents. Oh, I thought talents like a talent, like you're talented. But no, those are money. Those are units of money in the, in the Hebrew scripture or in the New Testament Greek. And some were given, you know, greater money, and then person who had five talents doubled his investment, right? And the one who had 10 doubled his investment. Then the one who had one, he buried in the ground. He said, you should at least put it in the bank to grow, draw interest. <laughs> and so when it comes to his kingdom, you know, you have, you, you, did, you squandered your investment. You didn't invest it. You didn't do anything. Therefore, when I establish my kingdom, you will not rule over 10 cities, five cities. You rule over no cities. So that parable, I think it's in Luke 19, that's something like that. But that, that, that parable there uh, also pictures, uh, you know, stewardship and faithful stewardship in relationship to the kingdom. So let's continue this uh, outline here. Underneath the church age and tribulation saints. Oh, by the tribulation believers. Look at Revelation 20, verse 4 through 6. Revelation 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they that sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Notice thrones plural. Not just the throne of Christ, but there's other places of, of other leaders here. Then I saw the souls of them who have been beheaded for their witness to Jesus. Now, this is not church age believers. If we understand the tribulation, these are those who refuse to take the mark at the midpoint of the tribulation. What happens to them? They're executed. Uh, so he's referring to, to tribulation martyrs. They were beheaded for their witness to Jesus and the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast. So it's very clearly referring to the Antichrist and the worship of the beast, or his image. That's the image that he sets up in 
what uh, Revelation 13, and the false prophet promotes his worship. They had not received his mark, the 666, that is described in Revelation 13, uh, on their foreheads or on their hands. So this is not church age believers. We're raptured before this occurs. This is tribulation saint. These are tribulation believers who refuse to worship the beast. What happened with them? They lived. Lived refers to resurrection. They were resurrected. And that they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Why? Because they were faithful till death. They were faithful. And I think this is, they are what? Rewarded. They are rewarded with rulership in the coming kingdom. These faithful tribulation martyrs. So we have faithful church age believers will have positions of authority over the nations. Faithful tribulation martyrs will also have authority. Keep both keep them up, keep in mind. Both groups, individual groups, church age believers and tribulation martyrs, will have a resurrected body. So as a resurrected believer, you'll have a glorified body in the kingdom and you'll rule and reign. And you say you have the objection of those who attack this position, dispensational teaching, they'll say, well, how can glorified believers rule with people in their natural bodies? I'll give you one answer, one word. Well, two words, Jesus resurrection, right? Did Jesus not eat with people in their natural bodies, his disciples? Did he not associate with them in his glorified body? And therefore, there's no problem with that. I don't know how people come up with these, these objections. You know, Jesus gave an example. He taught his disciples for 40 days. He associated with his disciples. He already had his glorified body. And there are people in their physical bodies. So in the kingdom... We'll have a mix of people with glorified bodies. We'll have angels there, by the way. Uh, the Lord, the, you know, the Son of God in his glorified body. So we will have this interaction, interesting interaction between glorified saints and people in their natural bodies. Okay, uh, let's take a look at kings underneath church age believers and tribulation saints. Psalm 72, verse 10 and 11. Gentile kings. The Bible depicts Gentile kings. Uh, these are leaders of various nations. Notice here, the kings of Tarshish and the owls will bring presents. Now, Tarshish is in modern-day Spain. And I'll show you on a map where that is. The kings of Sheba. Remember the queen of Sheba who pre presented presents to Solomon. And a lot of people think this is a Solomonic uh, song, Psalm 72. It refers initially to Solomon, but I think ultimately it refers to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I think this goes beyond Solomon. But the Queen of Sheba brought presents to Solomon in Seba. That's another nation in probably the area of, of Southern Arabia. They will come to Jerusalem to offer Christ's presence. Remember, we always sing this hymn, We Three Kings of Orient are, <laughs> bearing gifts, we travel afar. So, well, the Bible doesn't mention that there are only three, but we know there are three presents. So we assume there are three kings, right? They travel to present presents to the Messiah in his first coming. These are kings that travel to present presents to Messiah in his second coming. And this was the custom of that day, by the way. And usually it's our culture. If a president visits another country, there's some kind of gifts exchanged. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an honorable thing. And so these various kings, just like in Solomon's day, Queen of Sheba brought, you know, gold and other presents to offer to Solomon. So these various kings in the kingdom will come to give homage to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But it does show they're Gentile kings. Verse 11 says, Yes, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. Now, this obviously is not heaven because we have geographical locations here. On, as mentioned, by the way, in the table of nations. So let's take a look at a map on Psalm 72, verse 10. We'll look at 
this table of nations in Genesis 10. We have Tarshish mentioned here. This is southern Spain. Where did Jonah try to flee, by the way? He took a ship to go to the furthest place he could get away from God, Tarshish. So he would, from over here, he wanted to go all the way across the Mediterranean Sea, all the way to the furthest point before going out into the ocean. See? Tarshish is southern Spain. So what he's saying here is, even the furthest region at that time around the world, these kings will come and give homage to the one in Jerusalem, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we have Seba, this area of maybe modern-day Ethiopia. Uh, it's located here on the map. I have the arrow there. And Sheba, southern uh, Arabia, these two nations. So that notice that's far south and then far um, west. So he's saying, kind of giving a summary of these nations that are remote will come to Jerusalem and give presence to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But there'll be various Gentile leaders of countries. So this gives us a hint. At least those three we know. Those three nations in the kingdom. All right. Now let's continue in this um, uh, outline of the government here. Let's go back to our our slide here. Now, underneath those kings, there'll be other nations, Gentiles, in Psalm 72, verse 11, the same song, Psalm 72, verses 11 and 17. So all kings will fall down before him. So there'll be other kings, and the nation, Gentile nations, will serve him. So those under the authority of these kings various Gentile nations will also serve him. Notice verse 17. His name shall endure forever. His name shall continue as long as the sun, and men shall be blessed in him in the coming kingdom. All nations shall call him blessed. The king of kings and lord of lords, his name will be exalted. That's why a future kingdom, by the way, so he can be worshipped and exalted and honored. Think about that. What was left undone in this first coming, they crucified their king, will be done in the, in the future kingdom when Christ gets recognized. He, he will receive recognition from all nations honoring him. And if they want to rebel against him, they will how? With great authority. There will be perfect peace for 1,000 years in that future kingdom as a king of kings and lord of lords rules and reigns from Jerusalem. Now, I want to continue and just add a few other things here referring to that coming kingdom. Um, we're going to, maybe we'll say this for next week because I don't want to rush through this, but we want to talk about the timing of that kingdom in the book of Daniel. When you study the book of Daniel, you see many references to the coming kingdom. But Daniel refers to a literal, physical, earthly kingdom. Over and over and over. Not kind of some kind of mystical rule of Christ in your hearts or him ruling in heaven somewhere. It was a physical, literal, earthly kingdom that would only be established in the course of history as various successive Gentile nations would rule. For instance, like Psalm 2, and Psalm, or excuse me, Daniel 2, you have it, the image of the statue. You have Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, the revived Roman Empire, and that stone cut without hands that smashes the image and fills the whole earth. That is Christ's future earthly kingdom occurring only after the final phase of Gentile world governments have run their history. After the times the Gentiles have run their course, Christ will establish his kingdom at that period of time. And we're going to look at the various passages. I think there's a lot there. So I'm going to, I'm going to save this for next week, if you don't mind. We'll continue another week on the kingdom. If there's no objections. Uh, we're going to continue looking at passages that support 
uh, pre-millennial teaching, pre-millennial teaching, the fact that Christ will come first and then establish his little earthly kingdom. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your promises and your word of your coming kingdom. We know, Father, that Jesus Christ is exalted now, but will receive that recognition from nations of the world as he establishes his righteous kingdom upon this earth, ruling from the city of Jerusalem, bringing peace to this planet, bringing a righteous leadership to this planet. And Lord, as we see unrighteous rulers today, we can take heart that your son, who is the righteous king, will one day have a kingdom administration that is truly just and fair and right. And we will have a role to play, Father, as church age believers, and we'll have positions of authority as we faithfully continue to, to fulfill your purpose and plan for our lives here on earth. Continue to help us go forward by your grace. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.